All right. Hopefully everyone's coming into the webinar now and uh, appreciate your time. Welcome to today's webinar. Really looking forward to this conversation um, with my colleagues. And uh, my name is Chris Chilton. I'm the Client Strategy Director for Affinity. Um, and for some of you who I've met, uh, for those who have not, my, my job is really to focus on enhancing our customers' experience by working closely with them to set a roadmap for success and ensure that they're getting the most out of uh, their affinity solution. I do have a, a bit of a history in payroll and HR, having worked for Elmo and ADP and Oracle um, previously, where I've helped customers drive improvement and really transform their businesses. I'm looking forward, as I said, to this discussion because uh, projects change, uh, technology implementations are very challenging and the interplay between the people, the process and the platform um, can either make or break an implementation like this. But luckily I'm joined by a couple of experts uh, in this area. Um, I've got Brendan Deutsch from La Trobe University. Uh, he's their strategy and planning advisor. Uh, and I also have a veteran of these webinars and my uh, partner in crime, Jesse May Dean, who uh, leads our payroll practice. So thank you both for joining uh, today. Uh, Brendan, I might just get you to do a quick introduction. Sure. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for inviting me along. I'm really looking forward to getting stuck into this discussion. Um, so as Chris said, I'm a strategy and planning advisor at Latrobe Uni down in Melbourne. Uh, if it's planning related, I mean, guarantee that I'm going to be involved in one shape or another, um, sort of creating the link between the organization's sort of broader strategic plan um, and its execution, really. So at the moment, that's business planning, strategic planning, capacity planning, workforce planning, and even some connected planning as well. And that's only so far. <laughs> the year is but young so uh exactly thank you right. mate and again we really appreciate your time so uh very good jesse maybe a quick introduction to those who don't know you <laughs> yes hi um so i'm jesse i'm the payroll practice chapter lead so my team is heavily involved and responsible for customer transitions and projects as well as our higher level support um, my background, I've been in payroll for nearly a decade and kind of done every side of it. So um, between running pays, doing implementations, uh, managing teams, and then also managing in-house global payroll teams and also been on the receiving end of an implementation from a provider. So I've seen both sides. Um, quite interesting to have both perspectives. And yeah, looking forward to talking through that uh, background today. Thank you, Jesse. All right. So uh, as normal, before we move on, a little bit of housekeeping. We are recording the webinar, so um, you'll be able to uh, get a recording of that, share it with your colleagues, watch it again, uh, take in all the good tidbits that Jesse and, and Brandon will be sharing today. Uh, if you do have any questions, um, I'm not sure we'll have much time at the end, but there will be an email address or you can email us at inquiries at affinityteam.com. And the last thing is, as always, we'll conduct a survey at the end of the webinar. So if you're able to stay all the way through, that would be much appreciated. Um, the feedback is important to us. We are trying to provide a, a varied range of topics. So it'd be always good to get your feedback. But let's get started. So one of the most important things, uh, parts of a project implementation, whatever it might be, is the change management piece. And I know both Jesse and Brendan are, are well across this, but I might just start with you, Brendan, and ask, um, you know, what's the approach that you take to change management? There's obviously methodologies and frameworks out there, but maybe you could share with us what what, what you use to, to make a success out of a project. Sure. Well, I think just setting a little bit of background um, to that is in the business world, we, we can be a little bit overwhelmed with the frameworks and methodologies. You know, there are a lot of them out there. Um, but the important thing here to, I think, note down is that many of them are trying to kind of um, replicate the intellectual rigor from the scientific method, but there's a bit of an important difference. A lot of them are a lot more generalist in nature um, rather than solving a very specific um, knowledge gap or functional expertise gap. And so it means that there's a lot more flexibility in kind of adopting and adapting them. Um, and I think because of this as well, whether it be things like the ADCAR model from the ProSci 
methodology or the DMAC methodology and Lean Six Sigma, there are some commonalities across each that I try and use. So I'll sort of I outline three key things. First one is defining the problem. I think that, that that's a really important part of the change process of knowing what what is the problem you're trying to solve through the change process um, or the change review, whatever the or the project more broadly. Um, and this is important for also evaluate, figuring out how you're going to evaluate the success of the project too, because that's going to sort of keep you grounded throughout the project. Um, and the second thing turns around being a default to being inclusive with your stakeholder next early on when it comes to the sort of pre-planning. I think we sometimes forget some people may be indirectly impacted by change um, and that that's, they're really important to kind of get on site early on and start building that awareness of what's going on so that no one sort of gets an um, unusual request six months into the project and goes, what's going on here? And so it just kind of helps address that earlier on. Um, and then lastly, articulating what the benefits you're seeking to kind of obtain from the project as well um, is really important and something that I've seen across all of my projects has been really important um, because, you know, the benefits are often the biggest driver for the project, but just articulating that, defining that as clearly as you can really kind of helps keep you grounded throughout the project, but also during times when you might, you know, falter a little bit, it helps give a bit of momentum. So those are kind of the three key things that I think are important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I agree with uh, all of those things, I think, and Jesse's smiling there. Yeah. So <laughs> I think there's some, uh, there's some consistency there, Jesse. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, and so I guess once you've sort of got these uh, frameworks in place or you've got your, your sort of plan together, how do you then assess whether or assess the readiness of an organisation for change? Is there some flags that you see or? Um, sorry, was that for me? That's for you, Brandon. Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, sorry. sorry. No, no, that's right. Um yeah, readiness for change is a really interesting one um, because I think, you know, they talk about how change is inevitable, which I think is true. So in that way, it should never really be a surprise, but when you choose to start that change journey, that's the bit that's kind of not so random. And I think that's uh, something that's really, really important to consider when you are looking at the readiness of an organisation. So mm. part of the... <laughs> The elements here it's kind of like working tension so you know what, what are you trying to achieve are you trying to increase capability whether it be people or systems are you improving efficiency are you redesigning for some future proofing efforts um are you imitating or wanting to become that sort of best in class and mm. i think those that sort of line of questioning i found really important for assessing that readiness um, yeah. and that maturity and knowing that even if you have perhaps a lower baseline, that's that that can be a good thing because the, the opportunity to kind of grow from there means that the benefits can sometimes be a lot larger as well yep. um, with the right leadership to sort of go through the difficulties that I'm sure we'll talk about at some stage today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I, I think that questioning lens is really important for assessing the readiness. Yeah. And, and Jesse, I guess from your perspective, what, what do you see maybe from both sides of the fence. Yeah, well, um, something that Brendan said that really resonated with me was about the timing. Um, so really understanding what else is going on in your organisation or the industry you're in, because um, change fatigue is quite a real thing. Um, if there's multiple things going on or a big leg legislative change that's coming up, it might not be the right time um, to implement something new. Um, so really taking that stock of how the, it's going to impact and filter through your business. And if it is mm. the right time, I think that's quite important and not something that always gets thought through because people are eager for the, the new thing to, to get, get done and yeah. get going. Um, and then also as an organization, um, whatever the change is, knowing your why. Um, so we do tend to focus a lot on the actual project, the how um, and the when, but understanding why you're doing the change and being able to articulate that is going to really improve the ability to engage your stakeholders and yeah. everyone within the business. So having something that um, is definable can be clearly explained um, and then understanding where that fits into your strategic roadmap um, and priorities. So you can start setting that stage early. Um, so mm. if you kind of can get those two things defined and the timing right, 
then there's a lot of other things you need to, to focus on as well. But I think that's kind of that first piece for assessing your readiness. Yeah, no, um, very good. Brendan, sorry, you were going to say? So I was going to say, I love that why element. And I think it, it can be a little bit confrontational, that element, because a lot of people will think or make assumptions about what's already known. And so it really pushes you to actually examine that further. Um, and that's where that stakeholder engagement and that really inclusive one is really important because you'll start mm -hmm. bringing other people into the conversation who might not necessarily have thought about things like you did. Um, and, yep. you know, that, that, that's a really, it's a strength of the project teams usually to get that diversity of perspective. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I just wanted to say that <laughs> yeah. I agree with Jesse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um all right, so we've we've got the we've got the why we've we've got the the frameworks in place. There's always challenges in projects, right? Like I don't think any of us have been involved in a single project that doesn't have its lumps and bumps, right? <laughs> so, what are some of the col common challenges that you guys might encounter when implementing that change management initiative, and and how have you addressed them? Um, and I might, Jesse. You, you go for it and then over to Brendan. Yeah, eagerly chomping at the bed. Yeah, no, no, um, please tell me. <laughs> we, we've uh, talked about it a little bit. It's kind of come up in both of Brendan my mm. response, but um, that early engagement and um, across a diverse group of people. So knowing your stakeholders, um, coming from the payroll background and implementations I've worked on, if I was talking or engaging with um, the CFO, HR team, finance team, payroll team, mm. line managers, employees, everyone's going to have a different answer of what needs to change or what the issues they're facing are. Um, mm. So it kind of goes into what you're actually trying to solve within this project and change um, initiative. Yeah. So having, making sure that you've fully engaged um, everyone that could be impacted by the change. And I think Brendan mentioned earlier, there's some people that might be indirectly impacted as well. So really widening that thought process on who to engage with and get that understanding of what changes need to occur, or what, uh, what good looks like from this project outcome. Um, if that hasn't happened, we're gonna end up with gotchas in the project because something's gonna pop up a little bit later that wasn't considered. And then you're gonna have either scope creep or not getting the goal that you really intend. And then it also feeds down into that adoption of the change. So if people are heard and understand and see where their problems are being solved or addressed, um, it's going to help filter out that um, adoption process and reduce detractors if people are a bit resistant to change, which is human nature. We don't want to change um, by, you know, just by the way we're designed, but we can take mm -hmm. those steps to help. So that early engagement, um, I think, is quite important. And that it also allows for good communication throughout your change. Um, so the last thing you want to do is either, yeah, just drop a change in someone's lap and here's your new system you're using next week. That's um, going to turn people off from from mm. seeing all the, the goodness that might be rolled out. Um, and then also, you don't want to announce it um, at the beginning and then just announce something a year later when it's going live. So kind of that continuous focus on what's going on with the project, how it's going to impact people with the business and give you those checkpoints. Um, so that's something I've kind of seen when your your projects are going to derail something mm. along those either those um, kind of defining the scope side or communication there's been a breakdown yeah absolutely yeah Brandon what what in your experience does that look like yeah I think to kind of adapt Jesse's point around the communication there is that information flow like uh, I think that that that's can really undermine the change efforts and it's it's information flow happens organically even if there wasn't a change process but I think during times of change, this becomes a little bit of a high risk activity now. Um, and that means that some stakeholder groups in an effort to try and control the change, control the information flow, um, thinking that that's what that will do. But one thing that I've noticed is that you've got to be really careful with that because if you now just withhold information, that's going to be replaced by misinformation or disinformation. And that, that can really hurt a change effort so i think controlling the information flow doesn't necessarily control the change um and you know to pick on jesse's point about you know that constant communication of the change sometimes if there's no update that's still valuable for people you know have, saying that there is no change that there is no update can still be incredibly valuable yeah um 
And I think that that's probably a little bit understated. Um, and so transparency really helps address that kind of undermining. Um, and the second thing is around definition. I think that one of the big challenges is that lack of definition, that lack of pre-work, um, whether it be the changes goals, how you're going to evaluate the success, or even more crucially for me, the role clarity of people within the change or the project team. And so role clarity really empowers the project team to actually make that change. And it's mm. this is, I think we sometimes treat it a little bit haphazardly, um, but project teams often are made up by people who don't do that as their day job. Yeah. So they, they're doing this to build up some capability or build up their networks, whatever it is, that there is other motivation for being part of the project team for this. And so one of the key examples is that, you know, a chief HR officer might be sponsoring a project, but their role in the project is actually not to be the CHRO. Their role is to break down the barriers, to leverage their organisational knowledge. Mm. And I think that that requires a real mental switch and quite intentional one at that, um, which I think we really need to make super clear of. And that's, you know, project sponsors right through to the project delivery teams is providing that clarity on what is expected of them, what they can do, what they can't do, why can't they do certain things as well. Um, and so I think that that's, that's really, really important because it helps, as I say, it em empowers the team to make that change that you want to make. Mm. Um, if you don't define that clearly, then you start start running around in circles almost <laughs> and it's like why did we do this and then you've got to send out a damage control email of we made a mistake but we're not quite proud of it yet yeah. um, quite good to about with that role clarity is also um taking the chance to kind of take in stock when it isn't somebody's day or uh, you know normal bau job to be a part of a certain project is to understand their under co other commitments as well as i think that's another um uh point of contention we find in projects when somebody does have other roles that they need to achieve and other objectives so understanding within the project and the change initiative um, not just what their role is but what time commitment is going to look like and if that actually is reasonable um, because that's where um, when other priorities set in what's going to take the the back seat and if it is this project role um, there's obviously going to be a flow on effect of stages that might get delayed um, an impact yeah. of a blocker that pops up for someone else um, so taking really good stock at the beginning of the project and understand who those people are and how other um, items of work might impact that and kind of mitigate that into your timeline. Because um, I think you said earlier too, um, projects always have a hiccup. Um, I've never been on a mm. project that's gone 100% to play. Correct. Um, Correct. So knowing that things thing? will go wrong at some point and you need to pivot or assess, um, that's just a, a, a reality of everything we're going to work with. Um, so yeah. kind of going in with that mindset helps you um, adapt when you need to adapt. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're going to take a step back um, now. We've, we've already into the project, but I guess we have to take a step back too. And and so many businesses going through digital transformations now and, and looking at all of those things. But how do you guys think uh, businesses can balance? Because there is a balance, right, with anything you do, the, the balance of innovation, kind of where they want to be um, with maintaining what they currently do now, because obviously a big bang change can be detrimental and not successful. And then in our world, Jesse, and, and, and yours too, Brendan, I'm sure, the compliance requirements. So what, what do they actually have to deliver? So Jesse, I might just start with you. How does that, how do you see that balancing? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because um, it, it's something that I think we, we kind of do um, sometimes without thinking you kind of when you're starting mm. a project um, you do it subconsciously because you do look at the risk of what change is happening and how it impacts other areas of the business so in that assessment you're already starting to try to um, balance current state and future state um, mm. so it it's all about that focus I guess at the planning stage and understanding what your objective is and what the yeah. outcome is um, compliance is always um, especially in the payroll world is it's not a negotiable. Um, so understanding how that's um, fitting into your transformation and what your current state is, is actually quite critical. Because I have been on projects where if a customer was um, doing a non-compliant process, 
um, currently, the transition to compliance could be difficult because it might take extra work or effort, even if you're layering in the tools to make it easy. Um, mm. If you're doing something the wrong way, it could just be the, the yeah. easy way. So that's a, an extra challenge with the change um, because if you're used to something being a little bit simple um, and having a few extra steps, it does seem like we're, you're going backwards. You're not actually going in in the right direction, but those compliance yeah. pieces you do have to implement. Um, so mm. understanding why it's important um, and the benefit. So within the payroll space, um, being non-compliant comes with so many huge risks of um, yeah. fines, um, employee disengagement if they're being paid wrong, um, risk of being named and shamed in the media if you've been caught mm. out for, for doing that. So um, some extra effort or an additional process um, might take a little extra time to, to yeah. implement, but the, the payoff is going to be quite great when you're not facing those huge risks anymore. Yeah, so I think just absolutely. really evaluating and taking um, stock of those three, you can, you can find the best solution while still layering in the compliance. Mm. Brenda, did um, you want to add to that? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a really tough question. And I hate to be the guy to say it depends, but uh, yeah. I'm going to be. So, <laughs> you know, it, it really depends on the compliance requirement you know sure. some legislation and some standards sort of they prescribe sort of what you do but not necessarily how you go about achieving a certain outcome and i think the, the role of innovation in compliance will vary according to the standard but that's what it'll allow you to do you'll be able to invest some resourcing into coming up with a new way of achieving that outcome some standards, of course, are even more prescriptive on that you've also got to measure it a particular way and you've got to follow a particular process and all that. And you ha your hands are tied, really. You know, it's, yeah. it's compliant. You can invest in lobbying or something to try and change the policy or standard, but, you know, cost versus benefit yeah. becomes really, really important there. Um, so I think it's having that real intricate understanding of what that compliance requirement is. Yeah. Um, you know, in a previous role, I helped review a compliance process that was, they said, we just want this particular outcome. We don't care about any other steps in the process, just that's the outcome we want. Mm. And so once we, it was clear that that's what the outcome was, we were able to kind of think, okay, how can we think about this innovatively and or target real root causes that will drive that outcome? And yeah. so it meant that that relationship was a lot tighter. Yeah. Um, but I understand that not, not all legislation is going to be quite so forgiving. So it, it really does depend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, unfortunately. Yeah. No. Okay. You're the eat depend guys. That's okay. We <laughs> there's always one in the room. That's fine. Yeah. Um, all right. So guys, we're we're coming to time, and there's just mm -hmm. so much good stuff to talk about. But maybe if uh, each of you, and and I'll go with Brendan first. Um, how do you measure or is there keys for people to measure the success of a project? Because metrics are so important, right? It comes back to your why and all of those things. But in the end, how do you measure and what metrics do you suggest people might use? And Brendan, I'll start with you and then to Jesse. And then there's a couple of questions to go and I know we're catching up on time. So awesome. I'll try, I'll try and keep this brief. Um, yeah. <laughs> again, it depends. There we go. <laughs> You know, it, it, it does depend, but I think following a sort of a, a very simple framework, which is that sort of input process, output, outcome type model. So, you know, mm -hmm. what is the input? What are the people, tech, material resources to create a widget? Mm -hmm. um, the process, the number of errors in creating that widget, widget or time estimates for creating it. Mm -hmm. um, the output, the number of widgets you've now created or provide services for, yep. and then looking at the outcome, you know, what are the sales of this widget? So I think sometimes it's breaking it down to its absolute core. And, you yeah. know, metrics are a percentage, a financial indicator, a number of things. And I think we sometimes lose track of that. Um, yeah. But that's where it's important to take advantage of work that might already be done. You know, do you have a team that develop dashboards that are aligned to your strategy and your planning efforts mm -hmm. that you can then leverage <clears throat> to try and capture some of this so that you can have targeted action that, oh, if I do this, I expect that will go up. You do the thing and it doesn't, well, you need to review that. So mm. you know, I think really stripping away a lot of the noise is, yeah. is really, really important. 
um, yep. for defining metrics because we can sometimes get a little bit of analysis paralysis. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I'm guilty of that myself. So. Yeah. Jess? Yeah. I just add, I guess, a little bit to also about, I guess, defining the metric. Um, I just actually how you use that metric in your communication as well, um, which with the change management, um, if you kind of think of more, again, that adoption or um, people aligning to the change, having something to point to and explaining that impact to different um, areas of the business, because not everyone's going to have a tangible um, benefit from it, but there could mm. be those indirect, if there's time and cost savings here um, that opens funds for future projects in other areas or you know, whatever the, the messaging is going to be, but using those um, kind of as a, a strategic internal communication as well um, helps mm. that end adoption. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So Brennan, you're a you're a LinkedIn guru. That's actually how Brennan and I first made contact. So I was reading one of his recent articles and I am going to quote this. Um, it was not that they had the best strategy out there, nor the most abundant economic and people resources, not even that they had leadership teams representing everyone from the floor to the board. It was that they got shit done better than everyone else in the market. Great quote, love it. Um, I will find the origin of that. But Jesse, um, <laughs> I might just start with you. What has allowed, what have you seen that has allowed teams to, to get shit done? Yeah, um, I think one of the things that's resonated with me and the teams I've worked with is when um, we've kind of known the boundaries to work in, um, but then been given some flexibility and freedom on how we achieve that. Um, it lets everyone kind of put their own um, personality and spin into it and helps foster uh, an environment of that psychological um, security where people aren't afraid to try something and put themselves out there. And I think that um, a little bit on more like people management, but I've seen the best results out of teams and projects when there has been that um yeah, that almost the gift autonomy. of autonomy and, and yeah. able to to really kind of try something and give it a go um, mm. without fear of getting a slap on the wrist or um, <laughs> yep. or if you fail, what happens. So um, yeah. not all projects are going to um, allow for too much of that, but working that in where you can, I think, really helps teams uh, feel empowered to get the project done right. Yeah, awesome. Brandon, yeah. your yeah, quote, no, uh, your story. <laughs> <laughs> I think that trying things is really, really critical. And for me, that really stems from acknowledging that you don't know everything or what you don't know as mm -hmm. well. You know, we need to be prepared to think critically about our own knowledge, capabilities, skills. Um, and that's not just us as people, but the systems, the structure that we work in, yeah. all of that. I, I think we just, we don't, we have a very uneasy relationship with acknowledging when we don't know something. Um, and that's something I've been very intentional about trying to switch um, throughout my career is I go into projects because I don't know everything, yeah. but it's the seeking to know, to learn, to understand um, mm -hmm. that I think we really need to kind of bring into projects, bring into planning, bring into strategy, bring into implementation. Yeah. Um, and it's it can be quite empowering, especially when I think people are, incredibly lost which is often throughout that change process because it means that the expectations can often be quite level mm. if they don't know either then you can start creating that from the ground up which yeah like i said i, I find it quite empowering and very exciting to be part yeah. of those sorts of things absolutely um, all right we're on almost on time i really want this question to get in so apologies for anyone who's got to leave we are recording hopefully the recording will keep going um, I'm really big on a partnership between vendor and the client. And I think it only works when it is a partnership. Um, if Brendan, and I'm going to put it to you because Jesse's on the vendor side now. So um, I'm going to put it to you. Maybe if you could give people three key things that you would expect from a vendor to assist you in what we've talked about today. Okay. I think that the three things that stand out are treating it like a partnership. Um, and so that means not treating it transactionally. It's not, yep. if you do this, you'll get paid for it. So, um, you know, don't necessarily just be guided by the current agreement at the time. Um, and the second thing, because it's a partnership, it will evolve. And so that means having two-way conversations and communication with the vendor with particular problems that emerge. You know, you, 
you might think, oh, we didn't hire them to do that, so they don't know how to do it. You don't necessarily know that. You know, you open up that communication and figure that out um, mm -hmm. together. Like it's building that capability and building that relationship two ways. Yep. Um, and then lastly, this is both those first two points kind of founded in the idea that the vendor is actually going to solve a problem that you want solved. Yep. Um, you know, I think that having that problem solving lens is really, really crucial um, to ensuring that the vendor relationship has good foundations, but also can adapt as the environments adapt. And, you know, yeah. during change processes, if you don't have adaption, oh, that's going to make the change really, really difficult to sustain yeah. over the longer term. Absolutely. So, Guys, this has been awesome. I really have enjoyed it. We have run out of time. Uh, anyone on the webinar wants to get in contact with us, inquiries at affinityteam.com. There is a survey at the end. If you have stayed till this point, it'd be great if you could connect on LinkedIn. I'm there. Brendan's there. Jesse's there. Um, and look, we'll see you again next time. Thanks again, guys. Have a great uh, rest of your week and weekend. Yeah. Thanks for having Thanks us. Bye. <laughs> Bye.